In the startup world, it's pitch decks, not business plans that get companies funded. A deck is often the first impression an investor will get at the company, so it needs to look stunning, which makes a pitch deck an art, a science, but most importantly, a story. And this right here is the perfect outline, I think. I know this is a long video, so here you have it at the beginning. You don't need to scroll around. You can download this chart from our website. Link is in the description or in the little card over here. Now for the rest of the video, I'm going to dive deep into each one of those slides, what it should accomplish, and of course, why this structure actually works. So the deck should achieve three things. It needs to tell your company's story. It needs to convince an investor that they can make money with this company, that they can make money with the company and it needs to do that in under four minutes. What our company does for a living is quite literally help founders pitch investors. So we get to see hundreds of these decks, and I personally get to talk to dozens of these companies every month. And the most common problem we see is founders getting caught up in the slides and the details, like the rules on where they should focus the story. You'll find a bunch of articles saying that you have to keep your deck to under 10 slides or that you need to have a board of advisors slide but we base our thesis on some more tangible examples. Companies like Airbnb, Intercom, Buffer, Uber have released the actual pitch decks that they use to raise their first rounds of funding. And if you look at their structure, you can essentially find the same set of slides. Angel investors and venture capitalists have also learned to expect standard pitch deck as their first filter when they're evaluating a company to invest in. And venture firms like Sequoia have also released pitch deck templates of their own. And well, you ought to listen to them. So we're going to use that to distill this ideal structure for a pitch deck. And we're going to combine that with a little bit of storytelling. So storytelling 101, let's talk about that first, because who doesn't love a good story? A story of how this team used their wits to overcome difficulties, or a story of how everything stacked against them and they won by the skin of their teeth. I learned this stuff in film school and it ruined movies for me a little bit, but most stories, films included, follow a three act structure that looks like this. During act one, the setup, we introduce the characters and the status quo. We are presented with a universe that we can believe in and that we invest in, as long as it's realistic and consistent with our own experience. Then comes the plot point number one. Around a third of the movie and it's a point in the film where the story takes an unexpected turn and the plot changes its direction. So in this social network, this is when Mark Zuckerberg gets introduced to this platform that the Winklevi are building, Harbor Connect and he decides to steal it. So this first plot point opens a range of possibilities of where the story could go. As viewers, we are at the mercy of the script at this point, and we have no idea where the conflict could go. As the plot changes direction, stakes start getting higher. We care about these characters, and that builds excitement. It also builds up to the story climax, which comes right after the second plot point. Again, in the social network, the second plot point of the movie is Eduardo freezing the Facebook account. So it's another unexpected turn in the story, but instead of opening possibilities of where this could go, it narrows them down. So the second plot point is followed by the final confrontation in the story, which is the fight between Mark and Eduardo in the Facebook office, and then the resolution. So try placing a pitch story in this story arc. We can start with an introduction, the status quo, what's going on, how does the world operate today, what are the flaws? And then your solution slide is the first plot point. You're pivoting the direction of the story. You're disrupting the status quo and the possibilities are endless. Now you start narrowing that down. So the product takes shape, stakes get higher. We meet the hero of the story, which in this case is your product. So the second plot point and climax could vary depending on your business. Maybe it's in your traction slide because you tapped into an incredible distribution channel and you're growing super fast. Maybe the plot twist revolves around the competitors and how they foolishly overlooked something your team knows. Maybe it's about your team or your background and your unmatchable experience. It's at that climax when the viewer is most vulnerable and it's after that climax that you get to ask for money. Remember, a pitch deck is a summary of a company's story. If we can structure that story in the right order, then the next step is giving arguments on why the company is incredible. We can talk a lot about slides, the slide order, and the story, and, and we will, but in the end, your pitch deck needs to answer a question of fundraising. These are the questions. What opportunity have you discovered in the market? What have you built to tackle it? How does it work and who is it for? How much are you growing and will you continue to grow? And why are you and your team the team that can change the status quo? That's it. If you forget about everything else in this video, remember those four questions. Take your deck and find out if it succeeds at answering them. It's easier said than done, of course. We see founders getting lost on those technicalities, the market size, the business model, and the projections, when what you should be doing is focusing on answering those little set of questions in under four minutes. So let's combine that with the three-act structure. First, we have the setup. This is the intro, the cover, and the status quo questions. What's happening? Your solution slide becomes the plot point. We change the direction of the story. Then we have rising action. This is your product section. We're meeting the hero. And once we get into the market, how the market is reacting and how big the market is. The stakes are getting higher. 
And then finally, the crisis, your competitors and how you plan to beat them. It's the climax of the story. Your team, your competitive advantages, your ingenious rollout plans are all gonna be part of this resolution to reach this conflict that you've unearthed. And now you get to ask for money. So now before we dive into the actual slides, let's go over three different approaches that you can take depending on the context of where you're presenting or sending this pitch deck. So the term pitch deck is broad. I've seen it used to refer to a sales deck. You could even refer that to a movie pitch, but for investors, we have three specific decks, which are the demo day deck, the email deck, and the meeting deck. So for a demo day, the conditions for a demo day pitch are very peculiar. You have the founder presenting, so the slides don't need to be self-explanatory. They're rather a support or an illustration for what you're saying in the background. Um, you have a time limit, usually three or five minutes. So maybe here that rule of on the number of slides isn't complete crap. And then you're presenting in front of a large audience, which means that you should refrain from sharing confidential information. There are some regulations in the US around what you can and cannot tell non-accredited investors, which are likely to be in your audience. Now for the email deck. Most deals happen because you get interest to investors. Unlike cold emails, which is an approach many founders choose to take and you shouldn't, and we made a video about it if you want to check it out. So when you get an intro to an investor, they will either ask you to send a pitch deck or you will ask them if they can take a look. And this is the deck that gets you a meeting, which is the next step. And probably it's the deck that needs the most amount of work because it's going to be seen by a bunch of people. So the email deck is also used in other contexts, for example, when applying to an accelerator or when submitting your deck to a competition. But with that context, we can infer some characteristics about the email deck. It needs to be self-explanatory because the investor will consume it on their own without your voice or your narration. It'll also be the first impression an investor will get about your company, so it needs to look stellar. And it's only being sent to hand-picked investors, so you can reveal a little bit more of your secret sauce in the deck. It's also designed to get you a meeting, so you don't have to tell everything about your company, just enough to create attention, curiosity, and to get called to the next stage of the process. And here's a little extra insight. Platforms like Slidebean will allow you to track the activity of your slides, so we know we know in which slides investors spend the most amount of time. And it turns out VCs spend an average of three to four minutes looking at a deck. And you can't assume that you'll change people's behavior. So if your deck can't be consumed in three to four minutes, chances are investors will skip through some of the content and just give up after a certain amount of slides. And that's why we always encourage decks to be short enough so that they can be wholly consumed in four minutes. Finally, on the meeting deck, if the email deck gets you a meeting, you'll need a meeting deck. So to me, this is an evolution of the email deck. It's essentially the same thing with some extra details. A usual first investor meeting will go five minutes to settle and small talk, 15 minutes for you to go through your slides and your company, and then 30 minutes for discussion, questions, and follow-up. So as you can see, you're turning that four minute self-read into a 15 minute narrated deck. So it's just adding a little bit more meat. It may be unrealistic to build and maintain three decks, especially with the insane schedules that we often have. And that's why most companies just resort to making something that's close to an email deck and then using small variations of that for everything. It's a fair approach. I know that I've done it. So I think that you must understand the differences between these to avoid common mistakes like taking the same email deck to a meeting because you're expected to bring a little bit more or using a demo day deck, which is not self-explanatory to be sent via email, or sending a meeting deck over email, which may be too long. Great, now that we understand the use cases, let's look at the structure, finally. Based on everything we've covered, a fantastic pitch deck outline looks like this. So let's go over each slide. First, the intro section. I have this as a separate section, mainly because we have some optional slides here that I really wanna talk about, which are different from the status quo. So first, the cover slide. So the cover slide should have a five or seven word description of what you do. It should be simple, self-explanatory, and so short that you can read it without even trying. So this tagline is not a marketing tagline. It's a very brief description of what your company does. You also have, as an option, the traction teaser. So if you wanna hook your audience early on, you can include a short traction slide that validates your company and gets people excited early on. Remember, they are coming into this deck without knowing the context of your business. So they aren't really sure what you do or how you make money. So the information that you put in this teaser needs to be universally understood without a lot of context. Some companies choose to put an executive summary in there, and I never recommend adding one. To me, it feels like you're just spoiling the movie, right? So don't, don't do an executive summary. Also, you sort of have to cram up a bunch of information into one slide, which defeats the purpose of the rest of the slides. So I don't see a reason to include it. Let's go to the status quo section. Again, this needs to be a believable picture of the current world, like in the movie. So first you have the problem slash business opportunity slide. Most great companies solve global problems. Uber solved taxis, Slack solved excess emails and meetings, and Dropbox solved file syncing across devices. And there's a bit of an aha moment if you get this slide right, and if you can point out a problem that people have been experiencing 
investors have been experiencing regularly that's standing in front of them that's so obvious that they haven't seen it yet. And this slide can also make your whole pitch fall apart if you get it wrong, especially if you come up with questionable statements. Because if investors disagree with you about this premise, you might just lose them here. For example, I've come across a fair share of social media startups that begin their problem by saying, current social media is boring. That's an opinion, it's not a fact. You don't wanna get into an argument at this point. The investor might love spending time on social media, so you might lose them right there. Also, some companies aren't necessarily solving a problem, but instead they're tackling a business opportunity that has arisen. So examples here are mobile games, which certainly don't solve a problem. They're just jumping out on a business opportunity that they've discovered. Now for the solution slide. Think of the solution slide as a mirror to the problem slide. Remember, this is your plot point. This is where you break the status quo. Great solution slides are also concise. They don't involve technology or features. It's not time to talk about the product just yet. We're just presenting our thesis. What if instead of doing things like this, we do things like this? Now for the product section. There's a little bit of elasticity in this section, depending on how complex your product is or how much time you need to reserve for the next sections. You normally start with a product slide and you can approach that with a video demo, please, a short video demo, or maybe a how does it work diagram, or maybe a series of product screenshots. And these slides will probably not be too different from your marketing landing page. You can probably get some inspiration from that. Next up, a features or benefits slide. And I like to keep that to five or six benefits tops. And notice how I'm using the word benefit instead of feature. Because a feature would be saying that Slidebean is fully responsive. And a benefit would be that you can edit your presentations anywhere, even on the phone while on the go. While just removing the responsive jargon and adding a real life use case scenario, the statement becomes more impactful. You can also do an audience slash use cases slide. And you'll see that this slide is not included in any of the decks that we analyzed, but I think it's a critical slide, especially if you're raising seed or series A. The idea of this slide is to prove that you understand who the product is for, and so many companies don't know the answer to this question, and that's a common deal breaker. You can also do an infrastructure or underlying magic slide. So for products with a strong technological component or when the tech infrastructure is one of their core differentiators, it's also relevant to include an underlying magic slide. Next up, the market validation or the why now slide. This is optional, but a market validation slide is included to support products where adoption could be a challenge. For example, in the 2009 Airbnb deck, they had a slide to support the thesis that people would be willing to stay to strangers, couches. So they used uh, couch surfing and other examples to prove that people were looking for those options. We actually had our team redesign the old slide because it looked like shit, so here's the new version. Now for the business model. This is one of the easiest slides to solve and one of the slides that many entrepreneurs just get wrong. This slide is not about your projections. It's not about how much money you can make if you get a million customers. It's just about how you make money. So is it a subscription? Well, you don't need to lay out every single plan and its ins and outs. In my experience, that's gonna be changing regularly and you you're gonna experiment with a bunch of combinations. So just tell us that it's a subscription, it costs this much on average, it has a trial or not, done. Is it a product or service? Well, tell us what the price is, maybe the average order size, and give us an idea of the margin. Is it 30%? Is it 60%? Or maybe it's a marketplace, so how much do you charge for a transaction? 10%? Okay, done. That's it. Don't overcomplicate it. Finally, for this section, the milestones and roadmap slide, because I think it's an excellent bridge between the product, what it is, how much it costs, and what's coming up in the next section, which is the numbers and the traction. So to me, an ideal roadmap slide goes over some of the major highlights of your product evolution and your company history, and then it talks a little bit about what you intend the product to become over the next few months, not in the long-term future. We are not making financial projections yet, so this is a product section, remember. We're talking about the product, its vision, not the numbers, so don't get revenue projections mixed up in here. Now for the market section. You're gonna start with a traction slide. This is a slide about numbers. Numbers. Think of a number as a photo, but think of a chart as a story or a film. Saying that you've made a million dollars in historical revenue sounds cool, but what we want to know is the journey getting there. How much of that revenue came in the last month? How much was that month compared to the previous month and the one before that? What breakthroughs did you make that completely changed the direction or the tilt on that chart? There's no faking attraction slide. It is what it is, and that's why it's so important. Now for the go-to-market. How will this money that you're about to raise accelerate your growth? And we can answer these questions by covering three main questions. What have you done to get here? What are you doing now that shows promise that keeps you growing? And what are you going to do next? So remember, rounds of capital usually fund 18 to 24 months worth of operations. So you're looking, we're looking for a growth plan, a marketing plan, and how your company will get to the next fundable milestone before your money runs out. The most common mistake I see is go-to-market slides that lack focus. Can't count the number of slides that just say, oh, we're gonna do social media and SEO and influencer marketing. That's what everybody's doing. 
everybody has to do that these days, almost. So it doesn't make you unique, it makes you generic. A great go-to-market slide talks about two, maybe three very concrete channels that you're using to grow your customer base and that you will continue to use in the future. Next up is market size. So in the previous slide, we already talked about how big this company is getting over the next year. Now it's time to answer, how big can this company get total? The concept of that is TAM, or Total Addressable Market, but it's a bit foreign to many of us. So what does TAM mean? Using a SaaS, software as a service example, your market is not the SaaS market. SaaS market is $200 billion or whatever. It doesn't matter how big it is because you're not gonna get a percentage of that. Saying that you're getting a percentage of the market is just oversimplifying things. Your TAM is also not the size of the problem. So for healthcare startups, it's not the amount of money wasted on X or Y process that you're solving. You're not earning that money. Your company's not worth that. You're solving a problem and you're charging a fee for it. So startups are exciting to investors if their TAM is at least in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Again, it's not about inflating your numbers. It's about this self-assessment. Is my company potential significant enough to get investors excited. One of our investors did a fantastic piece on this explaining how to estimate your TAM. Steve Barsh, go check out the video that's hosted on our channel. Now for the why us section. Let's start with competitors. You can approach this slide as a simple business 101 chart like the one Steve Jobs used. You can do a table comparing features, or you can just summarize some of your core competitors. In the next slide, you'll talk about your competitive advantages or your secret sauce. When you talk about competitors, more than comparing features, more than comparing what your pricing is, it's about showing that there's something that you understand about the market that the others don't seem to get. That's what makes great companies, unique insights that you've discovered, that you and your team have discovered that established competitors haven't figured out yet. Complementing that, you have the team. So the founding team in a startup needs to have the skills to take the company to a million dollars in revenue. If you're building an app, getting to a million dollars in revenue requires marketing, development, UX, business operations. If you're building a B2B SaaS platform for enterprise, you need engineers in business development and sales. And I can't count the number of decks that I've seen where the current team doesn't have the necessary skills to reach that scale. You don't raise money to recruit people. You don't raise money to recruit people. You form a team and then you go out to raise money. Super common mistake. Now for advisors, I really don't recommend an advisor slide. Unless your investors know who the advisor is, either they're a celebrity or the investor is connected with them on LinkedIn, I would not waste any space on this slide. Advisors are great, they're helpful, but chances are they'll spend one or two hours a month with you, Tom. So the company is gonna be built by its team. That's the people that we care about. Finally, the ask section. So first, the financial slide, which is pretty straightforward. If you've been operating, we wanna see the last year of financial data. And then for everybody, we wanna see three or five years of financial projections for the company. Founders typically add a simple table with their SGNA, their cost of goods sold, their CAPEX and revenue with a final profit margin and percentage numbers requiring you to do some financial modeling. That's a story for another day. We have a bunch of content on how to do financial models. We have a financial model template if you wanna use it, so go check that out. And finally, the last slide is the fundraising or use of funds slide. So this should cover how much money you're raising and should be super clear about what your next fundable milestone is. We talked about this a little bit. so. A seed round is supposed to last until a Series A, a Series A to a Series B. So closing a round takes about six months. So this round should last enough for you to get to a Series A, or I mean to the next fundable milestone, plus a few extra months to actually close that money because it takes a while. You'll see that a lot of decks talk about, hey, this round will fund 18 months of operation. And that's not necessarily bad as long as the math behind that responds to a next fundable milestone. It's not about the time, it's about the metrics. And that's it. Those are all the slides in the deck. Don't add a thank you slide, you don't need it. So if all of this was useful, here are some tips that you can follow next. First, you should try our Pitch Stick Builder. It lets you just fill in the blanks and the slides will be magically generated for you. Second, we're releasing a 90 minute course on Skillshare, which goes over much more detail about solving each one of these slides, which I went through. If you still need help, our team can jump in and actually design and write the slides with you. That's our Pitch Stick writing service. And you can find more about that on slidebean.com. If you're still watching, you can hit that subscribe button and that little bell button and leave a comment and help the algorithm. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you next week.